Many of you knew that Emma and I were in Amsterdam in the summer. Of course you knew. Uh, my flights were cancelled and I missed one of the Lord's days I was meant to be preaching here. Archie certainly knows. Uh, as he got called up late for preaching on that day. But I, I want you to know we made good use of the extra day that we were given. And I've managed to get a sermon out of it. Because we were able to visit the city of Harlem, which is 12 miles outside of Amsterdam. And that was where Corrie Ten Boom and her family lived during World War II. And the Ten Boom family were Christians who were appalled by the Nazi persecution of Jews and others. And as I've shown and tried to explain to the boys and girls, they built this false wall in one of their bedrooms as a place where behind it up to six adults standing upright could hide when needed. They built this secret hideaway in 1943. And in February 1944, six people hid there successfully for 48 hours. While the Ten Boom house was ransacked by the Nazis. And after about 48 hours, a couple of local policemen uh, who were pretending that they were helping the Nazis but were actually sympathetic to the resistance cause, helped these six people escape out of a window, out of the house, and away to freedom. And those six people lived and were safe and well to tell the tale. But the Ten Boom family were arrested and sent to concentration camps, where in time three of them died. And it, the story of this family, and particularly Corrie Ten Boom, one of the survivors, is an incredible story. And the book and the film made about her life is called The Hiding Place. And she tells us that the name of that is taken from Psalm 91, the passage that we are going to study together today. So turn to Psalm 91, please, in your Bibles, page 497. Please have it open in front of you if you can, so that we're looking at the psalm together. Page 497, verse 1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Our version says shelter, but some other Bible translations that have put God's word into English. I use the word the secret place. The word that the Old Testament writer used in his language in this verse, in verse 1, literally meant the hiding place. He who dwells in the shelter or the hiding place of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And we want to study this psalm today under the title, Jesus, our hiding place. Jesus, our hiding place. And keep in your mind's eye, if you can, that hiding place, that place of safety in the Ten Boom home. As we look now at three main points from this psalm. First of all, safety in Christ. Verses 1 and 2. Safety in Christ. Let's look at the first two verses here. Really as a launch pad into the encouragements and the promises of the rest of this psalm. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And verse 2 tells us straight away where this hiding place is, this refuge. Look at verse 2. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. His safe place is the Lord. His shelter, to use the language of the first part of verse 1, his shelter is the Most High himself. He's inside God. He's wrapped up in God. He's surrounded by, those are the walls around him, the Lord, the Most High. To get at him, you'd have to go through God. Or the New Testament puts it this way, Colossians 3. Your life, if you're a Christian, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Jesus himself is our safe place Our hiding place. Because we're in a war. 
not in occupied Holland in World War II, fearing the Nazis. But the Bible talks about a spiritual war. Unseen forces of evil warring against God and his angels and his people. Your soul is in danger from the devil and hell. And it's only in Jesus that we're safe. So that's our first point. Safety in Christ. And I've used that phrase deliberately. In Christ. Because the New Testament. The second part of our Bibles. Constantly uses that phrase. To describe someone who's a Christian. Someone who's born again. Who's been given a a new clean heart. Had their sins forgiven by God. The New Testament says. You're in Christ. And it says it over and over again. In Christ. In him. In the Lord Jesus. And I think that Corrie ten Boom's hiding place. Gives us a, a good picture of what that phrase means. That there were people. Who were in the hiding place. And they were safe. And there were people. Who weren't in the hiding place. And they were in danger. And so surely the clear lesson this morning to all of us is go. Go to the safe place. Go to Jesus. And hurry. Hurry. The day that we visited the Ten Boom House, the tour guide picked six of the smallest people in our group. So it's four children and two adults. And you can guess who in our family got picked. Who who out of the two adults in our family. And they kind of reenacted this as if it was uh, in the World War II. And someone went down to the ground floor. We were on one of the higher floors. And, and sitting in the living room. As it would have been in the Ten Boom family home. And the ground floor of their home was the dad's watchmaker, watchmaker business. But they had a bell there that if enemies came, you rang the bell. And anyone who needed to get to safety went to the hiding place. And so someone went down and rang the bell and and the the tour guide was timing the six people to see how quickly they could get to the hiding place. Because it was a race. It was urgent. You had to get to the safe place quickly. And that's what God's word is saying to us today as well. This is urgent. Hurry. Get to the safe place. Come to Jesus. Look at verse 1, how the psalm begins. What does it mean when it says to dwell? Jesus used similar words in John 15. He used the word abide. Jesus said, abide in me or dwell in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Now that's a slightly different picture, a branch and a tree. And a hiding place. But but they're not totally different. This psalm is saying to us today. How can you be safe? How can you be spiritually safe forever? And the answer is dwelling in the Lord. As your hiding place. Jesus picture was saying to us. How can you be alive? How can you be healthy? How can you be producing fruit? The answer was the same. Dwelling. Abiding in the Lord. It's the same idea. It's done by faith. Look at verse 2. My God in whom I trust. But I want us to see today that you have to dwell. You have to come to the safe place. And get into the safe place. And stay in the safe place. One preacher says it's to dwellers. Not to visitors. That the Lord promises his protection. Don't just visit the safe place. Don't do what Emma and I did on our holidays. We didn't dwell there. We stayed in Holland a bit longer than we meant, but we didn't live there. Don't just come to the safe place for a bit. Don't just hear a bit about Jesus. Don't just come sort of close, come to church, take a bit of an interest in Jesus. The Bible says come in, come into the safe place. Dwell there, live there, fully commit 
by putting your trust in Jesus totally and his death on the cross for you settle in that's what the word dwelling even means in our minds it makes us think of a home settle in make yourself at home in him Come to the one who is the safe place and say to Jesus, can I come in? Make it personal to you. Verse 2 says, my refuge, my fortress, my God. Now look what else verse 1 says. It talks about dwelling in and then abiding in the shadow of the Almighty. Now it took me a while this week to understand why, I was asking myself, why does it talk about the shadow here? And the reason I wasn't understanding it is because I'm an Irish man living in Scotland. And we don't need and we don't really appreciate the shadows or the shade as much as other countries do. This psalm was written in the Middle East. Israel. It did make me think of our trip to the Gambia earlier in the year where it was... 30 degrees plus every day. And even as you're walking along the street. Chatting to your friends or the people with you. You're constantly looking for the the shadows. The shady part. So you can go there and get shelter. From the scorching heat of the sun. That's the picture here. And it brings a new angle. On what God is telling us in this psalm. Because in those hot, hot places. The shade. The shadow. It's a place of rest. It's a place you want to stay. And that's, that's important. We notice that today because that is a difference from the picture that I've given of the Ten Boom family home and their hiding place. That wasn't somewhere you wanted to stay. In fact, if you were in Harlem in World War II and there were Nazis ransacking that house and you were in the safe place, I have no doubt you'd be terrified. There's only a thin wall. You could hear those murderous men on the other side of it. Men who wanted you dead. You'd be terrified. Wondering if you're going to be found. But that's not the case with the safe place of Jesus. And so the picture now is the shelter from the hot sun. It's somewhere you want to stay. For a long time. And you want to rest there. And be content there. And that peace. Resting in the completed, finished, saving work of Jesus who has done it all. So there's safety in Christ. The second point here is safety in his covenant. Safety in his covenant, verses 3 to 13. It's the main big chunk in the middle of the psalm now. The covenant is God's solemn, unbreakable Loving commitment to his people. In verses 3 to 13, take these pictures we've already been given about safety for God's people, for those who are hidden in Jesus, and these verses now flesh out for us with lots more pictures the completeness of that safety. And the pictures... Now cover any and every kind of threat and danger and attack. Look at verse 3. The fowler's snare. That was a trap that was used for catching birds. The point is it was a hidden danger. The bird wasn't supposed to see the trap or else it wouldn't have worked. So some of the dangers in this psalm are wide open. In broad daylight. But we're supposed to see and to learn here that God's protection covers what's unseen as well as what's obvious. Look at verse 4. It ends with talking about God like a shield and a buckler. Now shield, the word that's used there, we know what a shield is, but the word that's used means a really big shield. And so it's probably too big for you to move around. You'd just hold it and you'd stay in the one place and you'd be safe behind it. But the buckler, that was the smaller shield that you took when you wanted to move around the battlefield. So whatever kind of protection, whatever kind of shield you need, God can be that. Verse 5 says, night and day, whatever time danger comes. Verse 5 speaks of threats to our mind and to our emotions, fear and terror. As well as threats to the body. The arrow. 
Look at verse 6. Just like verse 3, it mentions pestilence. The word the songwriter used in his language could mean a calamity, a disaster, a plague. Normally, we don't use the word pestilence a lot in our English language. But if we looked up a dictionary, we're told that it's any very serious infectious disease that spreads quickly and kills large numbers of people. I would say it's not hard since early 2020 to think of a modern day example of a pestilence. And it's worth noting just as an aside here about pestilence like coronavirus that this psalm wants us to know God is greater and don't fear because our news reports are beginning to fill up again with News about new variants and with rising cases. God's word is saying, he's greater. Don't fear. But more broadly here is talking about pestilence, calamity, disaster. And the point of this middle chunk, verse 3 to verse 13, is the completeness of the safekeeping of the people of God. Hidden dangers and obvious dangers. Malicious dangers and accidental dangers. Verse 11 says, in all your ways. And then the middle section reaches this thrilling climax in verses 11 to 13. Reminding us, verse 11, the unseen armies of heaven all around us. His angels. He commands concerning you. And reminding us also of triumph, not just survival, not just hanging in there, but triumph as deadly enemies are trampled underfoot. Verse 13. And I want to just pause for a moment on one of those pictures. Verse 4 God's care for his people. Described in this way He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. And we're to see there that God's care combines the warm protectiveness of a a mother bird and also the hard, unflinching strength of armor. Now, isn't that a perfect picture? Isn't that the perfect combination? Because when we feel unsafe, don't we sometimes need that sense of cuddling in, snuggling? Nestling like the beautiful picture here of the baby bird, little baby chick, in close under its mother's wing. And yet also a largely fluffy or feathery soft wing of a bird, even with the bones, isn't really going to provide you with much protection from, well verse 5, the next verse mentions arrows. And so verse 4 skillfully and cleverly pairs these pictures. The wing, but also the shield. Warm protection, but hard, unflinching strength. And it's such a picture of closeness, secure closeness, under the wing, close to the heart. Think again of that hiding place in the Ten Boom family home. And Emma was in it with another one of the mums and four children. Now think of how close you would be. There's really not much space, not much wider from front to back than than, than for just a a normal sized human being. Think how close you would be in there. Now in that case that's not a nice closeness. You're cramped, you're claustrophobic. It's hard to imagine people being there for 48 hours. But now I think of the lovely closeness of this son. A thrilling closeness. This closeness to our God himself under his wing. When you're in his safe place. There's warm, close protectiveness here. And it's paired off with shield-like, unflinching strength. Now, there should be a huge question in all of our minds right now. Does this psalm mean that the people of God will never get sick? Is Psalm 91 saying that Christians will never get hurt? 
No. It needs to be understood within God's covenant. That's why our second point is safety in his covenant. Within that solemn, unbreakable, loving relationship that God enters into with his people. Look at our psalm and where God has put it in our Bibles. Not long before this, we've Psalm 89. Begins, I will sing of the steadfast love. That means the covenant love of the Lord forever. Verse 3 of that psalm. God has said, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. So that's a psalm that's lots about God's covenant. And yet by the end of it, verse 50 onwards of Psalm 89. The writer's asking, but where is this covenant love right now? Things are hard right now. Where, Lord, where is your steadfast love of old? And then the very next psalm is Psalm 90. A psalm of Moses that takes God's people back to their foundations and reminds them that they have an everlasting God. And next comes Psalm 91. That very similarly is getting back to the roots, back to the foundations, back to the heart of the matter. The names that are used for God in the opening verse of this psalm take us right back to the beginning of our Bibles. The Most High is used of God in Genesis 14. The Almighty in Genesis 17. And so the truths of this psalm are to be understood in the light of that faithful, unfailing God And especially, especially his covenant promises, which are what this psalm reflects. And that's why I read from Leviticus 26 earlier. There God was spelling it out. If you keep my covenant, he said to his people, if you walk in my ways, here are the blessings. We read it, Leviticus 26, verse 6. You shall lie down and none shall make you afraid. Doesn't that sound a lot like Psalm 91, verse 5? You will not fear the terror of the night. Leviticus 26, verses 7 and 8. Says this to us. You shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Psalm 91 verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Leviticus 26 verse 11. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. Psalm 91 verse 9. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place. The most high who is my refuge. And I could go on drawing the the connections between this psalm and those Old Testament covenant blessing passages. The blessings and the promises in Psalm 91 are the blessings and the promises bound up in God's covenant there in Leviticus 26. Or Deuteronomy 28 is another important chapter. God says, if you keep my covenant, if you walk in my ways, here is what I'll do. But God's people in the Old Testament broke his covenant. They were removed from the land that God had had given to them. They were sent into exile at the hands of their enemies. Because their repeated disobedience brought covenant curses and if you read the second half of those chapters Leviticus 26 Deuteronomy 28 God had warned his people here's what I'll do if you don't keep my covenant and God's Old Testament people never experienced the fullness of these blessings God's covenant blessing in fact God's covenant with them showed them that they couldn't keep it but there's great news Where Israel failed to keep the terms of God's covenant. Jesus has succeeded. So that as our representative. If we are trusting in him. Jesus now offers to us. The fullness of the blessing of keeping God's covenant. 
And when this psalm ends, look at, just jump ahead to verses 14 to 16. We'll come to them in a moment. When this psalm ends with God saying, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. Well, it's it's not talking about you and me. By ourselves, we're not keeping God's covenant and keeping our side of the deal and holding fast to him in love. It's speaking about Jesus, the only man who's ever truly kept God's covenant. And this is the Father confirming that he'll deliver Jesus and anyone who's joined to him by faith. And it's him. And it's them who receive the covenant keeping rewards of this son. So Jesus, perfect obedience. Jesus, pure faithfulness guarantees that we, if we want to, if we'll trust in him, we can experience the fullness of the covenant blessings that there are in this psalm. But when? Psalm 91 saying there'll be no sickness now, here and now. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that if we're Christians, we've been given a down payment of God's blessings now. We've got a deposit, a down payment, but it's not the full amount. And that applies to Psalm 91 as well. That this is about when Jesus comes again, triumphantly bringing his kingdom at the end of the world. Then his people will fully enjoy these blessings of the kingdom. We'll experience the fullness of the blessings of this psalm in the new heavens and the new earth. The promises of Psalm 91 will most fully be enjoyed in that moment of victory. Until then... There is, there is still sickness and pain and suffering in this life. But it is also still true that for those who are hidden in Christ, nothing can conquer them. Nothing can defeat the child of God. Look at verse 13. It describes treading on the adder. That's a snake. Trampling the serpent. Well, that is exactly what Genesis 3.15 promised that Jesus would do and our king has crushed the serpent Satan and King Jesus promises in Romans 16 that he'll be crushed under our feet soon as well our king has won the victory and he will bring us to these blessings forever we've only got a little taster, a little down payment, a sampler of them now. But he will bring us to these blessings in all their fullness forever. There's safety in his covenant. There's safety in Christ. And finally and very briefly, safety is certain. Verses 14 to 16. It's certain. Just a simple point to close because these verses end the psalm with God himself speaking. Speaking about Jesus and speaking about those who are hidden safely in Jesus. Listen to these words. Verse 14. God saying, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Do you hear that? Do you hear why our third point is about certainty? Absolute certainty. God himself is saying, I will deliver him. I will protect him. I will answer him. I will be with him. I will rescue him and honor him and satisfy him and show him my salvation. It's certain if Jesus is our hiding place. Look at the simple, beautiful descriptions of these verses. They sum up for us some of the privileges that are ours as Christians. I said we we only get a down payment now, but, but look at some of the privileges that are ours. In verse 14, what God says about us. 
He holds fast to me in love. It's, on, it's only true in Jesus. We're not holding fast by ourselves. But look how he sees us. Verse 14, he knows my name. Verse 15, he calls to me. And we might ask, why is God speaking about us indirectly in these verses? Why does he keep saying he, he, he? Lots of times in the Bible, in the Psalms, God says directly to us, you, you, you. One old, old preacher puts it this way. It's as if God is speaking to the whole universe about what he wants to do for his friend. That's why God's saying he in these verses. It's as if he's speaking to the whole universe about the believer and saying, that's my friend. Here's what I will do for him or her. Verse 16 speaks of long life. Now remember, this is poetry. These are pictures. You can't stretch this too far. Long life in the Old Testament was a symbol of God's hand upon you and God's blessing. But we can't take this too far. We can't say that if someone dies young, God is angry at them or that God has failed them. Some of the greatest Christian martyrs and missionaries that have ever lived didn't live long lives by the world's standards. They didn't reach their their 90s or on into their 100s. Jesus himself died in his 30s. Not a long life by anyone's measure. But a full life, a complete life, a life in which he achieved what God had given him to do. And God's people will be blessed with fullness of life. And not one single thing listed in this psalm or otherwise, not one single thing can take his people from this earth until their work here for God is complete. At the exact moment. That he alone has chosen. And so Psalm 61 shows us Jesus. Our hiding place. I began with Corrie ten Boom. And I want to end there as well. She survived. Those concentration camps. Unlike most of the rest of her family. And she travelled the world. Speaking for, for decades. And many people would ask her, how did you cope with all of those hard things that God allowed in your life? And we might ask from Psalm 91, why does God allow pestilence and plague and terror and destruction and snares? And Corrie ten Boom, when she spoke, and this is part of what you, the tour that you can see at her house, she loved to, to show people an embroidery and flip it round and show the back. Or if you can picture a weaving or an embroidery, it's just the tangled threads and it doesn't really look like anything. And then she'd flip it round and show them the beautiful picture on the other side. And she wrote this piece of poetry. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colours. He weaves steadily. Oft times he weaves sorrow. And I, in foolish pride, forget he sees the upper. And I, the underside, we, we see the, the back of the, the embroidery. We, we see the tangled webs and the mess. God sees the picture. God sees the, the upper side, she says. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows He loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. Amen.